So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome each one of you here at this event at the Stias Pallenberg Center. My name is Christoph Poe. I'm the program manager at Stias, and I'm welcom welcoming you on behalf of the Stias director, who is here but was uncertain whether he would make it, so uh, happy to do so on, on Edward's behalf, as well as on behalf of all the Stias personnel, and if I may say so, all the Stias fellows who are currently here in residence. It's wonderful to welcome uh, everyone here. We are very pleased to restart our public lecture series this year with in-person uh, attendance, uh, as opposed to the past two years of virtual only public participation. Uh, we've, of course, learned a few things about virtual uh, operating in the virtual space, mostly that it can easily go wrong but hopefully not today. Uh, uh, and therefore, it is equally my pleasure to welcome all those who have joined us online, uh, from near and from far. Uh, it's, uh, I know many of our fellows from over the years have joined us. I, and to you and to everyone else, uh, a very, very warm welcome to, to this event. So for the record, I should mention, since, since we have the virtual uh, uh, session running that it is also being recorded. So to introduce our speaker today, I'm happy to call on Professor Cheryl Walker. Cheryl is presently also a visiting scholar at STS. Very nice to have you, Cheryl. Uh, involved in a project much related to, to today's lecture. She is, of course, also a holder of the research chair in the sociology of land, environment, and sustainable development and a professor of sociology in the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology at Stellenbosch University. So after Cheryl has introduced Professor Beinart, he will present his lecture for about 45 or 50 minutes, and there, thereafter I'll be happy to chair a discussion session. So Cheryl, thank you and welcome. afternoon, everybody. It's also my pleasure to introduce um, William, William Baynard, this afternoon. So highlights from his very distinguished career are already included in the flyer, um, in the, uh, the brief biography that accompanied the flyer for this lecture. And given that he is one of South Africa's foremost historians, many of you will be familiar with its contents anyway. But inter alia, since 2015, an emeritus professor and fellow of St. Anthony's College at Oxford University, where he was Professor of Race Relations from 1997 to 2015, a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Southern African Studies since 1981, with stints as joint editor and chair of the editorial board, president of the African Studies Association of the UK from 2008 to 2010, fellow of the British Academy since 2009, author of 11, I think this is right, I've counted correctly, sole or co-authored books, 13 edited book collections, and very many articles and book chapters spanning, but not only spanning, also weaving together the fields of agrarian studies, environmental history, which he has really championed, social history, and the history of science, and much more, including, of course, and, and as Christoph has said, a fellow at Steers. But what I really want to emphasize is the exemplary, humbling combination of breadth and depth of his scholarship. He's able to move easily, or he makes it look easy, between authoritative overviews, such as his very widely cited 20th century South Africa, major comparative studies, such as his work on environmental history in Africa, and detailed local studies of smallholder production, rural resistance, migrancy, and social change in the Eastern Cape and former Transkei. He's also no armchair historian, but combines archival work with extensive field-based research and empathic immersion in the communities and places and issues he studies, both past and present. And he's also an exemplary academic citizen, generous with his time and knowledge and support as I have experienced myself. This extends to being a committed public intellectual, ready to put his knowledge at the service of claimants, lawyers, and NGOs in restitution cases, 
and to engage in robust, but from his side certainly never shrill or polemical debate with colleagues and critics around important but contentious contemporary issues, notably land reform and agricultural policy in this country, as well as the place of statues of historical villains in public life. And I'm really looking forward to hearing how he draws on his deep well of knowledge about changing agrarian and environmental conditions in Southern Africa over the last 250 years to reflect on the very topical issues of land reform and rural production in South Africa today. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to visit Stias. It's a privilege to do so. And also the opportunity to give this lecture. My talk concerns the difficult issue of land reform and I should say at the outset, as noted in the flyer, that I'm suggesting a pragmatic approach that prioritizes production, rural livelihoods, projects, and partnerships with gradual redistribution. And I must also thank Peter Delius, because many of the discussions that have led to this paper have been with him. Also, disclaimers, as always, I'm a historian, not an agricultural expert, I don't represent anyone, and it's really my engagement with rural history for over 50 years now, um, and more recently with land reform policy that makes me brave enough or uh, foolish enough to take on these issues. This debate can't escape history and rhetoric and race in South Africa but I hope that my paper will largely be around trying to understand evidence, offer ideas for debate, and inch beyond these in framing priorities for looking at the future. So my aim is to develop a few points around what I see as taking place to try and root what I'm saying in the political economy and talk about routes that may facilitate growth. And I realize that colleagues at STIAS may not have much background, so I will provide a little. And for those that are immersed in these issues, your patience, please. This is the central dilemma in a way. Land reform <coughs> remains important to address past injustice. Black people, were legally prevented from owning or purchasing land in much of the country under apartheid. But in the context of persistent poverty, income is central for rural households, as is economic growth for the country, especially after COVID. The Presidential Advisory Panel on Land Reform, which reported in 2019, probably the most significant overview from government recently, even though it had many contradictory elements, argued that land reform must be oriented around growing the agricultural sector to foster economic development and not purely be an exercise, sorry, an endeavor to transfer land. I have a lot of slides. I put most of the text on the slides, so be patient, you can listen and watch. What I'm not dealing with, I'm not dealing with historical injustice, I'm not trying to address urban and peri-urban issues, which in my mind should be considered in the same frame of discussion. There's still a major movement from the countryside to the cities and the towns, and the provision of secure land and housing in urban and peri-urban areas must be a priority, and I think more money should be spent on it. I'm also not asking whether land reform is the most effective redistributional strategy, and of course, the state is politically committed to it, but I'm exploring a little of what it can offer, may offer, with a focus of num on numbers, but all my figures are approximate. The context, so during the last decade, economic growth has stalled in South Africa, corruption's become endemic, the ANC's been immobilized by divisions, and inequality appears intractable. There's already been economic stasis for the last five years or so, seven years, with growth 
at less than 1% a year. COVID lockdowns have resulted, they say, in a 7% contraction of GDP in 2020, and this is not going to be remedied in the next couple of years. 98,000 deaths, but ex excess death rates indicate substantially higher, and the civil disorder in July 2021 directly reflected political tensions in the ANC and the inequalities that have been exacerbated by COVID. In some ways, the most shocking figures are the GDP figures. GDP per capita, which peaked briefly at $8,000 in about 2010 to 11, declined to about 5,500 in 2021. So standards of living for most South Africans, and particularly the poorest, are slipping, unemployment increasing, and South Africa fell in global GDP rankings from about 20th in 1960 to 26th in 1994, and some now place it at 38th. So it is worth trying to internalize this, that relatively South Africa's economic growth has slipped and quite precipitously in comparative terms. South Africa is 122 million hectares, some numbers to try to introduce the scale of land reform. 90 million hectares is usually given as the agricultural land, but 55 to 60% of this is arid and semi-arid. In 1994, roughly 14 to 15% of the land was held by African people, mostly in the form of Bantustan's homelands. It wasn't all the worst land. Some was in the wetter eastern parts of the country. Some was densely settled. But it's worth emphasizing that millions of black people lived on farms. So a map of the former homelands. The rest is sometimes called white South Africa, but it's white owned. All of these areas had a majority of black people living on the farms. It's also worth trying to emphasize that land reform is a very elusive thing to define. It's been very diverse and multi-sided. Some has resulted from popular occupations of land, especially in urban areas, resulting in the huge informal settlements that you see and this has probably included the most people. Then there are government-led schemes of restitution and redistribution, which have transferred most of the land and some private transfers by purchase. I don't want to try and define land reform. I'm going to adopt a fluid approach here. The Presidential Advisory Panel, that's 2019, thought that 10% of agricultural land had been transferred about 8.5 million hectares, 350,000 hectares per year, it works out as, and there's been a big push on state land in the last year or two. An article in 2021 suggests that 17% of agricultural land has now been transferred by all routes, and this includes private purchase but that would suggest, if you add the former homelands, that the total land in black land holdings, ownership to some degree, is over 32%. I want to focus on production and food and start with the agrarian economy. So establishing the large and largely white-owned farms was a central and violent project of settler colonialism and apartheid and the state as well. But now that they've become so important a feature of the countryside, my question is, would unraveling the majority of them be economically destructive? For me, the evidence suggests that it would. A fundamental issue is keeping capital and skills on the land and adding to them. 
And so I will be suggesting that they can in part be a spine for new initiatives facilitated by some of the ways in which the agrarian economy is changing. It's counterintuitive, but despite the uncertainties of policy and climate, large-scale commercial agriculture in South Africa has increased significantly in value and volume over the last 10 years, and especially over the last five years. There's often talk of drought, of climate change, yet, and of expropriation without compensation and similar policies. Yet, counterintuitively, there's been intensive investment in certain sectors of the agricultural economy. Gross income has risen sharply over the last few years, and probably be higher in 2021. And there's been an expansion in lockdown. Agriculture, although only about 2.6 to 3% of GDP, produces 10% of exports. Again, this is increasing, probably from 10 billion to $11 billion last year. It's amongst the most successful countries in agricultural production. A good example is maize. Four of the largest harvests ever have been reaped in the last six years, 16 to 17 million tons, 40 billion rand in 2020. And because of the sharp increase in global maize prices over the last year, maybe 50 billion in 2021. I find these very striking figures, and I'll use maize and a few comparative examples from neighboring countries, because it is, of course, the most important staple for poor people in the region, and also Index Mundi, from who I took this graph, have got good comparative figures. Citrus. The most valuable export commodity, 20 billion a few years ago, estimated at 25 billion in 2021, maybe the second biggest exporter globally. And it's expanding despite requiring, requiring long-term investment. Again, it's surprising that a tree crop, which needs extensive investment, it's very expensive to set up citrus plantations now, constantly changing cultivars and strains is receiving so much in investment. Domestic consumption and juice is about 30 to 35 percent, but it's important to emphasize that export production provides the abundant cheaper fruit for local consumption and nutrition. Sorting out export from domestic consumption can be complicated. 120,000 jobs, and usually for a large farm sector, it, jobs are increasing, though they're mainly seasonal, and striking expansion in the area planted at the moment. The most value of all, in fact, is poultry and eggs, over 60 billion, and poultry is by far the most important meat consumed so far. And Large-scale commercial agriculture is diversifying and innovating. Soya, viticulture, fruit, citrus, avocados, macadamias, vegetables, berries, all of these are growing at quite a fast pace. Agriculture and mining survive best through COVID. These old, you could say, elements in the South African economy and around Although around 2.6 of GDP narrowly defined, perhaps climbing to three or more now, the estimates that include inputs, processing, transport, and so on, sometimes given at around 12%. Land prices increasing, employment stable, maybe even going up. Wages are low, but there has been an improvement in minimum wages. And I want to, throughout this talk, try to use numbers, probably too many numbers, to give you a sense of where poor, what pe poor people earn. 
and what can be generated um, through agricultural investment by smallholders. Lots of figures, but what I'm trying to get at is that the capitalist agrarian con economy is in many ways surprisingly dynamic at the moment, diversifying, investing much more machinery, and that this is very seldom factored into a discussion of land reform, and I think it should be. It doesn't need subsidy, but it does need certainty. The evidence on smallholders is very uneven. Now, by smallholders, I mean those people who were in the former homelands, Bantistans, 14 to 15% as mentioned. And perhaps some of those on the roughly 10% of agricultural land that has been transferred. There aren't any adequate national figures or reporting. In fact, this is in some ways a tragedy, in some ways crazy, that a government for whom land reform is so significant a policy doesn't really know what's happening. None of us really do in the smallholder sector. And there's little published on what's happened on transferred farms. Government figures suggest smallholders producing about 5% of maize. This is based on estimates, satellite images, some local surveys. But village surveys also reveal very limited arable production in fields. And the yields, on average, are about a third of commercial growers. The livestock economy is much more lively and healthier in communal areas. And it seems, from reports, to be the main focus on newly transferred land. And there's less of a gap with commercial producers. Nevertheless, severe disease problems and relatively low rates of reproduction Cattle go down to the beach here, uh, by the way, because uh, there are fewer flies, and, and it's cool. So there are available government statistics, and the estimate of, quote, non-commercial maize is that the area has declined from 450,000 hectares to 315,000 hectares over the last 10 years or so. The actual production is probably stable because yields in government statistics have gone up. Nevertheless, it's not a very encouraging picture that even though land available to smallholders has increased and there is plenty of land within the old Bantustan and homeland areas, largely in forms of customary tenure, that there's no strong overall evidence of an increase in production. I expect there was a sense in the early years of land reform that if people got land, they would produce. And it doesn't appear on the whole and with some exceptions, that this is the case. The literature, of which there's a lot, notes both resilience and withdrawal. And the evidence for both, but it points to, I think, an overall pr process of ebbing agricultural engagement by smallholders over the rough, roughly the last 30 years in the context of decline of the peasantry. And my own views have shifted, I think. I wrote more about resilience, and remember in the 1990s said, Transkai and smallholders are still sufficiently resilient, engaged for an agricultural reform program to ba be based around them. I've modified that slightly. One, was, one reason was a period of fieldwork, 2008 to 12. Another was a reaction to the vocal support for fast track and for the nationalization of land that emerged around about 2015, 16. And one could understand the political motivation for attempting to get some dynamism into the land reform program, which the government didn't seem to be pushing adequately. 
The presidential panel as well suggested quite rapid increase in the amount of land that should be transferred. And in some ways my talk is raising questions about that. Is this the wisest route? I think that production may be stabilizing rather than dropping now, but I won't go into that. We can try in questions. So where in the village I worked in, in Boiki, there was a fertile alluvial plain where the old established village families had their lands, but had been little cultivated since about 1990. And this is confirmed in a neighboring village, which there's an article on in 2020. The reasons are very complex. And again, in some sense, is counterintuitive. Why don't poor people use their land? Or don't poor people use land that is available to them? A big literature, and very rapidly, the costs and the risks in relation to the benefit are often seen to be too small to work on one or two hectares. So you could say land sizes are too small a complex question as well. I think a key thing, not so much emphasized, is that peasant agriculture was dependent on family labor, especially women's labor. And women and youth now have different ideas about appropriate work. There's, just, there's declining child labor because of school, and there's declining collective work, amalima as it was called. And then there are issues like what I call the tyranny of cattle. With young men and boys not herding any longer in largely unfenced communal areas, as one old man told me, the major problem that is affecting the people when they're growing millies is the cattle. The cattle are just walking about everywhere. There's no control. You'll be planting for the cattle. And then there are issues of theft and control of land, which I can go into if you wish to. So there's a partial comp compensation in focus on gardens next to homesteads, which is more common. And I'm going to into this in some detail, because in a sense, the, the argument for a rapid land transfer is surely that there is a peasant economy which is about to be freed and will step into the land and generate new production. But even the percentage of households cultivating gardens varies very greatly in the rural areas. From about 25 to 75% in neighboring villages in one study, it's very low percentage in dense settlement areas. And one 2016 study of 120 households showed 10% of fields were cultivated, about 50% of people cultivated gardens, an average size of about 400 square meters, and perhaps produced an average of 20% of maize and 34 to 40% of vegetables. So this is a larger garden in the village I was working in, unfenced, as you can see, quite a traditionalist area, both vegetables and maize. These, this is a different village with it being planned betterment fenced gardens. These are 0 0.1 hectare plots, which exactly have that amount, roughly 400 square meters cultivated. It's not enough, and these people, only 10% of whom are cultivating fields as well. It is not enough to generate subsistence. And it's a mistake to call this subsistence agriculture. It is agriculture for subsistence, but it reaches nowhere in aggregate subsistence. Now, there are many who argue that government figures underestimate and the kind of material I'm presenting underestimates because many smallholders have poultry, pigs, goats, grow dacha, Gathering is quite widespread. Wild fruit from prickly pear, on which I co-authored a book, to num num. Medicinal and useful plants. Informal markets are important, and especially for for livestock. And they're regular every weekend. Customary slaughters. 
in villages. So informal markets are significant, and I accept that entirely. Um, but I don't think that it adds up to a very significant difference in the actual food supply. And does it matter is the question. Should people simply be able to get land, political land in a sense, because of the injustice of the past? There's even environmental improvement in some parts of the former Bantustans because of the withdrawal of, from agriculture and climate change, which is encouraging bush and rewilding. I think it does matter. It matters because ultimately, for poor people, food, livelihood, incomes are the key. And that's why there is still such a rapid urban migration, because in some senses of the failure of the smallholder agrarian economy, which has complex and historic reasons. I'll just briefly mention the South African state's approach to redistribution, because it's moved through three or four phases. And now it focuses partly because of the failure of a more communal, or perceived failure of a more communal approach at the beginning to an increasingly narrow gap group of beneficiaries through proactive land acquisition strategy. Much of the literature is, let's say, highly critical of the achievements of, trans of, of those who've received transferred land. Gogela and Quinty, then minister, reckoned in 2010 that production had declined or failed on 90% of transferred farms. And this is one reason for pursuing PLAS strategy, which tried to focus on those who were seen to be able to make a go of commercial farming. But Mayer noted in a recent article that government materials suggest roughly 20% of PLAS farms were reaching their potential. Land reform is often seen to have failed over the last 27 years. I've got a slightly different view. I think that the transfer of over 10 million hectares is an extraordinary achievement, except for Zimbabwe, which I'll come on to in a second. Can you name me any other country which has achieved something like that? The land is now available, and my argument is that we need collectively to be thinking about what to do with transferred land. But let's look to Zimbabwe, because as I mentioned, there was quite a strong push, and in certain ways there still is, for a fast track approach to get things moving. And expropriation without compensation is sometimes thought of. The core of debate, we had a conference on, on it last week, is thought to be part of the of the issue, that this would facilitate rapid land transfers. Zimbabwe, for me, shows, and I expect for many others, the dangers of fast track. So in 1981, looking at 10-year averages of production of maize, 1981 to 90, 1 1.8 million tons per year. But after fast track, in 2000, you can see it plummets to about 673 million tons per year. And even now, in the last 10 years, when it's begin, beginning to revive, and there's a great deal of literature, in a sense, arguing that this has made fast track worthwhile, the last 10 years has only seen a resurgence to 1.26, but still quite a lot lower than pre-fast track. It was a major contributor to the decline of the Zimbabwean GDP by about half. By contrast, it's interesting also to look at Malawi, which in a certain sense is the striking example of smallholder success in the region. Um, 
not so well known. And I'm giving these figures as well because I want to make two points from, from them. Firstly, that neither Index Mundi, which has all these graphs, is in any way prejudiced against smallholders, or that I don't see the potential in smallholder production. Because in 1991 to 2000, production was on average about 1.5 million tons. Over the last 10 years, it's been about 3.4 million tons. And during the last year, it was over 4 million. It's quite striking that Malawi, a small country, very largely smallholders produce more maize, uh, very much more maize than Zimbabwe, which was sometimes considered the breadbasket. It was never the breadbasket. I mean, these are small figures. Nevertheless, Malawian smallholders produce something like a quarter of the maize that South African commercial farmers do. And on an area of land about the same size as the former Bantustans, and the population, by the way, is also about the same. If those areas could produce the same as Malawians did, well, firstly, it would be five or six times more, but also it would bring in roughly, at prices last year, 12 billion rand into the former homelands. Plus, of course, all the additional economic activity that go around it. So I'm also trying to point to the potentialities, to the significance of this. That's the equivalent of half, half a million pensions in South Africa. These figures, for me, are significant to think about because they show potentiality and the land is available. It's difficult to get an overview of evidence but my reading from the recent history of smallholders in South Africa, from transferred farms, from the experiences of Zimbabwe, is that fast track or ambitious fixed percentages for transfer are not the route to go. There's no shortage of arable fields or space for fields in the former homelands or on transferred land where there's sufficient rainfall. Malawi also shows us, and the key point was 2006, where the government introduced against the advice of donors largely, systematic input subsidies, that input subsidies are the way to go or the way to start thinking about investment. Investment is the key to increase in livelihoods. There are many differences between South Africa and Malawi. I won't go to them, into them in detail now, but uh, I think we can take at least the idea and more and the possibility of more experiment around it. And this leads me on to the second half of my talk, which is around partnerships and joint ventures. Now, much of the transfer of land has been state-led, funded by the state, and one of the great difficulties or problems has been post-settlement support and investment. There really hasn't been an adequate follow-up when people move on to the land. Things look a bit different in an extraordinary variety of private sector initiatives that are beginning or have been taking place for some time. And it might be although it's very difficult to quantify this, that land reform has in fact already become significantly more a private sector-led development than a state-led development, although often in partnership, essentially bringing together the commercial farming sector and smallholders, including new collective owners, new smallholders, Farmers, private companies, commodity organizations, NGOs, as well as government departments. The sugar scheme launched in the 1970s was the first, and it had essentially an outgrow structure with smallholders on customary land. Peak involvement was about 50,000. It's now down to about 12,000. But 
There's so many different developments in forestry, wool, dairy, avocados, beef, maize, fruit, citrus. And I think that there have been over 80,000, perhaps 100,000 smallholders and collective owners participating, but of course not all are active at one time. Many of them have involved input subsidies, extension, knowledge transfers, financial management from the private sector rather than the state. But the state does provide finance and subsidy as well as political pressure for black economic empowerment. And it's important to emphasize that organized agriculture, largely white still and corporate, although not by no means entirely, was quite resistant to land reform to start with and is now less defensive, taking initiative. One of the most interesting schemes was by the National Wool Growers Association starting in 1997 for sheep owners in communal areas with shared costs between the Wool Trust and the government. And they, what is so difficult on communal land is to control the reproduction of animals. Without fences, you can't control rams. So they had the idea of flooding communal areas with pedigree rams <clears throat> and did that amazingly successfully, 3,000 a year, maybe 50,000 in total, providing training and infrastructure, sharing shred sheds, and critically, channels for marketing. Almost all wool is exported. The wool produced by the new rams and smallholders or smaller sheep keepers was taken, was graded and taken into the main clip of which it was about 0.8, about 8%, which very largely goes to China. You can see in the background there, that is probably a sheep eaten pasture with rather short grass. This initiative was important because it developed village-based associations, new organizations, and income from wool through the formal auction system for smallholders went from very little to 383 million in 2017 to 18, with about 25,000 participants, largely men and not the poorest, but the income goes into the villages. Things have fallen back a little since then. And the point that there have been very detailed surveys of it, bigger owners can get about 50,000 rand a year which is about the same, as I mentioned, as the agricultural minimum wage. So none of these are huge amounts of money. But what was so interesting for me in a survey from 2020 is that the average income <coughs> from agricultural sources in the households that participated in the scheme was 30,000 rand, about half the household income. And I've seen no other survey in South Africa where, in, amongst smallholders, where agricultural income is half of household income. It's usually much lower. Small amounts, but significant for poor, poor people. Another example, which is much more a partnership rather than outgrower arrangement, is the <coughs> Grasslands Dairy Trust. It's a successful dairy company extending production to an additional farm. Owned, or ownership was given to 49 black dairy workers. They became 100% owners, which meant they could sell. I'm coming back to that as well. The state subsidized 35% of the original purchase and the company provided inputs and marketing routes. And by 2018, each trust member of the 49 workers received 150,000 as a share of profits in addition to wages. Now, to achieve this kind of partnership result, you need smaller numbers, larger profits from intensive production, and quite large scale production. But there have been many parallel developments some 
times I hear when I'm talking about these issues to colleagues, but oh, there's Solms Delta and there's Grassman's Dairy. But if you begin to look at the agricultural landscape, aside from the big commodity organization engagements in sugar, sheep, forestry, um, there's surprisingly many. Amadlelo, which in fact runs the Forte University Dairy. Solms Delta is famous because it failed. Um, it was an enormous, enormously ambitious attempt uh, to set up a wine farm and to buy on an extra farm which workers would own and run. But they spent so much on social provision rather than on production that they couldn't sustain it. Whippold, which does maize and vegetables, Cernic, which does beef, and others. So I'm struck, and just to, because I visited them last week, mentioned briefly Cirrus Witzenberg PALS. Um, in 2006, a Cirrus farmer donated land to farm workers with some government assistance through the LRAD formula. The farmer provided infrastructure and mentorship. The farm workers labor and operational farming inputs. It's a 50-50 arrangement. And then that started a trend where others picked up the idea. And in 2014-15, big fruit farmers in the area with a legal firm and a Slombosch academic launched the Witzenberg Pals Partnership in Agriland Solutions. There are many different types of partnerships within this. But in this case, unlike the dairy, not only was there close mentorship, but the white farmer stayed as part owner and perhaps as part uh, controller. The key thing with PALS is to make these workers agricultural enterprises. <coughs> you could say that was Solms Delta's failure. So, Land reform with expanding production, business principles, solid legal structures, mentorship, training. There are about 30 projects now, and they're committed to private sector leadership. Motives, well, the farmers make local political gains, show social commitment, get new investment as well. And they are trying to achieve export and Woolworths quality, nectarines to garlic and veg. Small schemes, they, they don't allow trusts to be big, but they believe that land reform is not a zero-sum game. There's a shared interest in water access, new farm dams, new plantings, and critically a thickening web, web of rural relations around production and income generation. And they're very ambitious. They're expanding this model to other provinces. Nectarines, these are the ones you may well be eating if you shop at Woolworths. <laughs> so, I'm just illustrating a few examples. Many more could be pursued. And briefly, restitution farms. So, restitution is a different form of land transfer, a legal right to land from which people have been forcibly removed in the apartheid era. And Ratumbo and Ravela are two transfers of land which had been intensively planted with macadamia and subtropical fruit. This was, these were two of seven farms which were really a showpiece for the government. They wanted them to succeed. They started a communal property association and a partnership which failed. It's been well studied, but it was politically important enough for the government to bail them out. They found effective managers for these two farms. Others are not so lucky. So in these cases, there are roughly 300 CPA members, you could say owners in a sense of the farm. And the critical issue for them, as on many CPAs, is that poor people who acquire land through restitution want income. And yet to maintain and develop intensive production on fruit farms that have often been neglected for a few years during the very long process of transfer and then subsequent failure, you have to invest. Um, this has been at the heart of the tension 
for many CPAs, communal property associations, and these two farms, the CPAs have decided to reinvest much of their profit and forego annual payouts, of which would be roughly 25 to 30 percent a year. Sorry, 25 to 30,000 rand a year. Again, small amounts. So it's important not to see these as purely private. The state has subsidized many partnerships, but it's often uncertain subsidy. And just let me mention the RAM purchase. About three years ago, the government which had been funding the RAM purchase at 10 million rands a year, roughly, again, not such a lot of money, because it was an investment that produced over 300 million rand for sheep owners in income. So you could say worth, they withdrew it. And one reason was that they felt that most of the money was going to white sheep farmers who were the only source of supply for pedigree rams of the kind they needed. There were other reasons as well. And this is a central issue should the state take long-term commitments to subsidizing agriculture, they want these projects to become self-sustaining. Should, in fact, the beneficiaries, <coughs> some of whom are getting 60,000 rand a year, pay a levy and sustain the, the, the costs of their own rams? Sorry. I'd like to end with one example and then some concluding points. I left Zimbabwe on a rather depressing note, but there has been one extraordinary success in Zimbabwe, and that's tobacco. Up to 2000, most of the tobacco is produced on commercial farms, and after fast track, that's the rapid transfer of land in Zimbabwe, production dropped to a third of what it was. And there were losses to the economy and state revenues. But in 2005, a Chinese company established input and purchasing schemes. And it's extraordinary how quickly this took off amongst smallholders and medium holders. Within 10 years, there were 100,000 growers. And they were nearly back to 2,000 levels of production. And the critical thing is the connectedness to global and Chinese markets. This has also allowed reinvestment, often into food crops. And it might be that the resurgence of smallholder tobacco in Zimbabwe, along with a couple of other things, is really the route to economic recovery and the figures, again, are really very interesting. They exported 10 billion rands. So remember, citrus in South Africa was 20 billion rands, half the value of South African citrus in 2019. And the average earnings for Zimbabwean smallholder tobacco producers was $4,000 or 60,000 rand. Malawi has had similar success. And South Africa, it might be, could replicate this around cannabis. But I won't go into that now, as time is short. So I've tried to give concrete examples, nuts and bolts, illustrate processes, too many figures, you'll forgive me, networks where gains have been made. These gains are often limited, but they're significant for poorer households. But it is important to emphasize that in very few cases are we talking about more than 50,000 rand a year, the value of two and a bit pensions. Yet when pensions, say, are added to that amount of money, it starts to make a difference to rural livelihoods. Partnerships of smallholders, communities, collective owners, commercial agriculture, NGOs, seem to be creating synergies between larger and smaller enterprises. 
Beneficiaries, of course, have their own politics, and the politics from below has shaped the process as well. It's also immobilized production in some cases. Pursuing a discussion of private sector engagement isn't an argument against the state. In fact, the state can and has facilitated over the long term, and I think can leverage private sector involvement, which can be an increasing source of finance and transfers. Private sector partnerships can broaden financial responsibility and a transfer of expertise. In a certain sense, it's a self-imposed tax by commercial farming and commodity organization, organizations, which has a political rationale, obviously, to support the commercial agrarian economy more broadly and private property and to meet BEE requirements. Some that I've interviewed see it as having a social purpose as well, both locally and more broadly, and they sometimes frame it by a critique of the state and the ANC and see this as an alternative route of deracialization and partnership. And I think there's another element to this which interests me, that it's a route less punitive to existing private landholders than expropriation without compensation that may spread the financial burden but wouldn't discourage investment into agricultural production. I haven't yet got figures which would enable me to say how significant it is or may be, but I think it's worth thinking about. One of the key things about expropriation without compensation, of course, is that it would fall on very few people who happen to own land which the state wants. In fact, the legislation at present is narrow, narrowly framed. It should, I think, come from a general tax. In other words, it wouldn't, you wouldn't need to raise that much more tax to buy a whole lot more land. In fact, as you've heard, my argument is that the urgent thing is not to buy land. The urgent thing is to invest in land. That's the crux of land reform for land reform now. Nevertheless, a general tax, but it's often argued that a general tax would fall on some black people as well as it would, and that because land holding was restricted on a racial basis before, that shouldn't really be the case. And I'm thinking of this as an alternative which would both in a sense, encourage investment and provide some alternative financing for land purchase and investment. I think partnerships are also facilitated by the growing diversity of forms of land ownership and perhaps the separation between landowners and those with technical expertise to set up production. So landowners at all levels now don't really make the decisions on how to plant the nectarines. They are increasingly dependent on companies providing inputs, consultants and experts, irrigation, soil, fertilizer, pesticide, tree planting and netting. And in a sense, the actual nature of, I mean, the landowners and managers need to make decisions, but key elements, key elements in the technocracy of farming have shifted, as it were, upstream. It's also possible that privately led initiatives are now having a wider reach, particularly those of the commodity organizations, sugar, wool, forestry, than the narrowing redistribution policy of the state. That's an intriguing point for me because it is often assumed that privately led redistribution would be narrower. And it seems to me also important that there should be scope for ownership of land and accumulation by this route. After all, it is the case that 
historically white South Africans have benefited hugely by the capacity to accumulate from private ownership. And of course, not only them. Another big debate which I've been involved in. This doesn't preclude state schemes and a great deal of land is available. Land redistribution has outpaced effect, effective investment in production. By no means all schemes succeed. There will be failures. But the knowledge generated in such transfers, I think, will be important for tens of thousands of people because it's transferable. And we make the same argument about the history, about history. Many times we're asked as historians, what use is history? Well, our argument is that history produces transferable skills and knowledge. To conclude, there are very many different imaginations about the priorities of land reform and what the future should be. They're starkly different. Chiefs want kingdoms. Old men want cattle. Communalists and environmentalists want eco-friendly village societies empowering women. The private sector wants science and commodities, nectarines, avocados, and wool. I'm not quite sure what the state wants, perhaps in its different guises, a variety of these things. But perhaps all do share an idea about improved rural livelihoods for the poor. And I've tried to describe some of the dilemmas and suggested that the large farm sector is not only economically vital and needs certainty, certainty but that enhanced state expenditure with private sector skills and a direction towards production could result in significant rural income generation and some alleviation of poverty. Thanks. Thank you very much, William, for that wonderful, comprehensive view, uh, multifaceted, uh, and also those really interesting case studies and proposals. It sometimes helps clearly to listen to a historian on the matters of the day. So thank you for that. We will open the floor for uh, questions uh, and comments. We have two roaming microphones, and uh, we would like to request that you do use the microphones, because that will ensure that our online audience will get to hear you clearly as well. Um, we will limit, for the start, we'll limit the questions to the audience who's here in person. If time allows, we'll have a look at any comments and questions posted online, uh, but uh, we'll prioritize it here. That doesn't mean uh, that you should, those online should uh, not participate. We'll, it will serve as a record and we'll keep it for uh, the purpose of, of um, the speaker and, and uh, others. Uh, I suggest that we take two questions at a time, William, if that's yeah. okay for you. Right. Uh, also, as a wise mentor of mine always said, please only ask questions to which you do not know the answer yourself. Uh, at least, no, at, least for a, at least for a start. <laughs> so, so we'll open the floor for the first two questions. I'm Michael Reddy. I'm a, actually a former student of Williams. Um, I was just, to your point about um, subsistence agriculture not necessarily being subsistence agriculture per se, but sort of contributing to subsistence. I mean, in the context of the sort of structural unemployment that we live with and that's going to inevitably define our future for uh, a long term, a, a very, very long time to come. Um, and the context of sort of, you know, all this discussion around the basic um, income grant and that sort of thing. Um, is that not, does that not sort of make the case for, well, subsistence, subsistence agriculture, and I, I sort of say that in inverted, qual uh, inverted commas, but does that not make the case for, for I don't know, greater sort of 
uh, a greater role for subsistence agriculture? Um, yeah, thanks. John Mattison. Uh, um, you may have, I think you touched on this, but I'm not quite sure I got it. What is the number of agricultural workers now compared to 1994? Because we all heard stories about uh, workers leaving the farms or being thrown off the farms when the rules changed after 1994. So, in response to Micah first, absolutely. <laughs> My, I would see as a fundamental priority, it's just that I didn't focus on it so much in this, in this particular talk, but in a couple of other papers, one of which was done with Peter Delius, we've tried to look at priorities for interventions in existing communal areas, and they are obvious things, but input subsidies are again significant. My, my point, I think, or the point, it's not a new insight in the world, is that connectivity, capital, are vital for people to increase production of any kind, of maize or vegetables, etc. And so it's been the isolation of those farmers in many respects that, and land reform that serves only to transfer people, as it were, without creating those connectivities, um, I think should be reassessed. And so I can suggest lots of ways in which it, it might happen. But yes, anything that could create incentives and encourage people to produce, well, more maize, that's another question, but more vegetables, a greater variety of, of crops locally. And Issues of <coughs> come up as well in relation to land tenure and the security of investment and the capacity to protect your crops. As you may know, during the period from the 1940s to the 1980s roughly, a policy of betterment was introduced in the African rural areas. And this clustered villages with gardens, as I showed on one picture, planned areas, and the fields were put elsewhere, sometimes a kilometer away. And for me, this was a tragedy. This isn't the African. In most places, it's, well, let's, let me qualify that, but in the areas that I know best, on the east coast of the country, this isn't a traditional layout. And if enclosure, in a sense, had happened around existing plots, where people could control the land around them, I think this would have facilitated the kind of improvement in subsistence, particularly if land rights could be better secured. So I don't know how we rectify that now. It's very difficult. But it's also difficult to extend a garden around a plot within a village. And yet it's equally difficult in most of these cases to protect arable land a kilometer away, like those fields that I showed. In fact, a major problem for those fields of bush pigs, which I won't go into, but there is a surfeit of, there's a, a, a problem in the coastal areas, especially of bush pigs, which eat vegetables. So I don't think what I'm saying in any way minima, minimizes the importance of encouraging diversified food production. And I would support the basic income come grant, not only because it will add to the income of the poorest families, but also because almost all the surveys and statistics I know suggest that it's those with more income that produce more food. In other words, there, there isn't an inverse relationship between income and food production, or at least there wasn't until about the 1990s. It's a complex issue again. Um, and I've entirely forgotten, I should have got Yes. Okay. Agricultural work workers' numbers have fallen very significantly until about, um, they went down to, as far as I remember the graph to about 700,000 in the early 2010s. And this was for the reasons that you might imagine of mechanization, but also farmers trying to get tenants and those who were not working 
of their land. Um, it then picked up significantly around about 2015, but I'm told that this is a result of a different form of counting. And I don't know enough about the actual figures, but you can see it goes up to about 800,000 again, and it's remained relatively level, falling slightly over the last few years. And different, I mean, in different places, citrus, for example, is increasing um, employment. There's also a pattern of fewer permanent employments on the farm, and farmers trying to diminish the number of people living on their farms and greater part-time or seasonal, particularly seasonal employment. And of course, <coughs> the expansion of fruit um, and a, as one of the elements in what we're discussing um, leads to pressure for seasonal employment. It's not the kind of uh, commodity that you, you need people on the farm the whole time. But there doesn't seem to have been a significant reduction recently since 2015, but it's fallen slightly over the last few years. And what was the figure you had before? Oh, crikey, I'd say 1,400, but I, 300, but I, sorry, no, so 1,300,000, but I stand corrected. Yes, but it's been, yeah, it has been. Okay, thank you. So the next questions were the person in the pink and uh, next, Jonathan, after him. Thanks, Professor. Professor. Um, please um, help me a little bit here. Firstly, let me say I'm happy that you opened your lecture by addressing the notion of race in the land question. Race and racism and race relations in South African context. Interestingly enough, today here in Steers, the room is so wide, full of white people, discussing land. And of course, the majority of people here are fellows in Steers, this institute. Most of them are white Europeans and Americans coming from outside Africa. I'm happy that the director here is a black African appointed in 2018. Three years down the line, the institute and its fellows are white. I've spoken here with the fellow, the gentleman, just today. And then, of course, he was interested in me because he's so striked to see a black man at the stand. And I ask, him, why he thinks so, and of course, come up with some answer here and there, but I'm saying part of the racial problem, Professor, about land is the human resource that are being produced. White people are scholars in advanced scholarship here at STS. Majority of them are not Africans. Then you expect a thorough land scholarship that will reason by the foreigners. They can't do that. African scholars are excluded racially here. None of the South African fellows are in steers. Why is that? The director must answer that question. Why is that? And that you expect a clear land reform scholarship that will then influence community outside, in the rural areas, and so on and so forth, that's a mythical engagement. It's a lie. What will then happen here as it is happening? Agri Forum, which is led by white people defending white interests, goes to United States of America, tell lies about South Africa. Agri Forum, both scholarly, intellectually, and otherwise, is produced here in Stellenbosch get support financially here in Stellenbosch. And yet you expect us to debate clear political issues where the majority are the beneficiaries, both in the past and in the contemporary moment. That is white people. 
We cannot accept that. It is wrong and it's mythical. Even this institute, I'm happy the director is here. Even this institute is in fact doing injustice to this debate. It's prolonging unreasonably so. But I can tell you, of course, the scarecrow, even in your lecture, the scarecrow of putting Zimbabwe in parallel with South Africa, we can see that. You are slowly telling us that do anything that Zimbabwe did, you will be where Zimbabwe is. It's okay. But I can tell you, as scholars, and of course myself as a scholar who is excluded by this institute to come here and sit here and study, you only have three scholars here. My brother here from Zimbabwe, my brother here from Uganda, whose name is written from USA, from Uganda, and then my sister from um, Nigeria, none of which are South Africans. You are excluding South African people because you know as white people that to have white South Africans and black South Africans, there is a historical question of race relations because you know South Africans will never accept at their homeland to be excluded both intellectually and scholarly. And of course, the question of resources. Why would you have the majority of fellows in this institute all of them are white above their 60s. What are they going to do in helping Africa and helping increase the intellectual capacity and influence young people outside, telling them about land production and the productivity of land? You talk of rural community. You are happy because you are a visitor there. I was born there. When I go there, I go home. My mother is working in the garden. Works the garden, plant vegetable. I have to buy 500 um, liter tank with the money that I don't have. So, because I see that she needs water so that she can plant her garden. But what I'm trying to say to you, the theory that white people have been producing for us as black South Africans is a lived reality. It's a painful lived reality. But when we, we, we strive ourselves to come in this institution, we are systematically excluded. I'm happy the European fellows here, they must know they must not be lied to. The reason why you can't see black South Africans in that fellow, in that, that institute, you can't see them, they are excluded systematically. You then have a black director who is a symbolic figure, absolutely powerless in terms of changing the status quo of this, of, of this um, university, both the university as well as the institute itself. Because if you go back in 2010, how the institute looked like, and now 20, 2021, 2022, how the institute looks look the same way. I mean, how many fellows here is plus minus 30 fellows or so? None black South African, three African scholars. Why is that the case? I'm saying therefore that we cannot talk about, re about land reform, land restitution without confronting who is talking about this subject. How is that person affected materially? White people have interest when they talk about land. Therefore, we know that it is their cousins and their fathers and grandfathers and their brothers and sisters who are farm owners. Therefore, your interest, Professor, it is detected in this scholarship as a consultant, as an intellectual producer, and everything else. Right? Now, I'm saying... All what we are doing here is unfortunate, Professor. Give the same lecture in Kailicha, give the same lecture in Umtata, where majority of, of, of people in the room are black people affected. This is a joke, first and foremost. And the director must take responsibility. We will always make sure as black people to say, you remain a house negro in that position. You remain a puppet in that position up until you've got the majority or at least half of the executive in that position that you are leading surrounding you as black people. Otherwise, we know what happened here to the former vice chancellor here in Stellenbosch, Botman, who died because of stress, because he was the only person who was, t was on top, and the rest of the people in the university were white people. The same pressure that the professor is going to feel. And this is why we are saying, therefore, that he must prove to us that he's not a house negro who is put there to defend the house master. What is happening here in real terms is the master narrative 
of defending white interests under the disguise of white scholarship from Oxford University. The very Oxford University, I'm happy, Professor Williams was sitting on Rhodes Committee when black student, influenced by Rhodes student at UCT, I mean UCT student, who said Rhodes must fall. He sat in a committee there. He recommended, he recommended together with his committee that Rhodes statue must remain in Oxford. He was sitting in the committee. That is true. Where is the objection? Have you seen it? Where? My sister, no, no, no. You see, this is the attitude that we are receiving. When white people see the problem, they are coming in defense. But what I, all I'm saying is that this is linked with the race relation. I'm saying up until we have the majority of black people in this hall, professor, as a director, we can have an honest, truthful debate on land reform, restitution, race relation, and racism in this country. Thank you very much. observation and then a question. One was, it was interesting to see you showing a slide of cattle by the seaside. So in a way, those cattle were like Europeans coming to the seaside in order to get away from the flies and also to be cool. And that's because those cattle actually are Euro-Asian. And uh, my question is, why are indigenous animals and plants absent from the discussion so much? It, so many of the plants and the animals that are being uh, cultivated and are, are, are supposedly economic. And yet at the same time, people come to Cape Town and hope to see uh, an array of whether they're from outside or whether they're just locals and neighbors, whoever they are, there is a great deal to be learned about South Africa's fauna and flora, and particularly its potential, economic potential. So I wondered what you might have to say about the absence of indigenous plants and animals in the Economy and in the rural economy of Southern Africa. Should uh, treat that as two, or <laughs> you can respond as you see fit. Well, I don't know if you want me to respond. I mean, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards if you wish to. I agree there should be more black scholars at Stias. Um, we can debate what I've said. I don't know if you. Have got. Do you, do you want me to try and respond? Or, it's, or uh, that was appropriate, I think, but uh, you're welcome to say more if you wish. You know, I, I would like the audience to be different, and I'd be very happy for the ideas that I'm pursuing to be criticized. I'm certainly not making an argument against land reform with regard to Zimbabwe. I was quite careful to point out the successes of a commercial tobacco economy and how central <coughs> this is now to the recovery of rural, rural incomes and livelihoods in, in Zimbabwe. Where we probably disagree is on the issue of the rapidity of transfer of land. And I don't have a number in mind. I think that the government has kept a steady amount of land, or has transferred a steady amount of land every year. In fact, it still stands at about 350 to 400,000 hectares. My issue, and the one that I'm asking everybody to consider, black or white, is what would be the costs of dismantling the capitalist agricultural system in South Africa to livelihoods and to the economy as a whole. 
particularly in the context of a 7% decline of GDP during COVID. And in this sense, it's, I understand there's a trade-off. I would love to see a buoyant smallholder economy which would, would enable one to make the argument that there won't be costs. But at the moment, I don't see the evidence of it. That's why I call what I'm doing a pragmatic view. I'm trying to understand what would be the costs of doing it and what alternatives, what alternatives there are to, to, to create a more general and deracialized buoyant agrarian economy. And that's the crux of what, what I'm, I'm arguing. Um, but I accept that it's, it might sound uncomfortable in relation to the strong historical and rhetorical arguments about the necessity for land reform in the country. The government is obviously thinking about these things. And in fact, you could say ANC policy has in certain senses been trying to bridge these different pressures. So they have on the whole not really tried to, to push capitalist agriculture or to undermine it. Um, expropriation without compensation may be a point at which it seem that they begin to. My own sense is that the legislation, that the president himself is not particularly keen on this, that it's something that he's accommodating from the EFF and from radical groups, more radical groups within the ANC. And in, it's enabling legislation, but that it may not be pushed very hard, or it may be pushed hard only in very particular circumstances, like peri-urban, <coughs> the need for peri-urban land, which I agree is completely, is, is a priority. Um, so I hope I've expressed what the points I'm trying to get across, and it is not an argument against land reform, and I've even tried to emphasize, which I'm probably in a minority of about one, that I think a good deal has been achieved in terms of the transfer of land in this country. Um, it's, the, it's intensifying production on the, that, this land and other and additional transfers, it seems to me, more, more urgent. Jonathan, it's such a complicated question that you ask, but I would say that, and I can't give you percentages, that the great majority of African food crops are not indigenous to Africa. Um, I mean, maize is most obvious. It's the single most important food source in Africa, certainly in Southern Africa, and it's not an indigenous plant. The indigenous older established plants like millets and sorghums have largely been abandoned, even though they're more nutritious, but they're very, very difficult to grow in quantity, and they're very difficult to protect against birds. And so the yields you get from them, um, or let's say you've got to have very sophisticated systems to. Um, livestock is very interesting as well in that there have been so many introductions over such a long period of time um, to South Africa, going back to the Dutch period even. And then cattle diseases that have destroyed large quantities of the animals here. So obviously rinderpest in the 1890s, but there were earlier diseases like lung sickness, bovine pleurite pneumonia in the 1850s, um, red water fever in the 1870s. There's been a whole series of cattle diseases which have probably helped to wipe out much of the indigenous livestock. Um, East Coast fever, 
which is an African disease, came down into South Africa. And in some areas, like the East Coast, KZN, Eastern Cape, wiped out about 80% of the cattle. So it's unsurprising in a way that there's a hybrid cattle stock in the country now. There have been attempts to breed and to distribute Nguni cattle, that is cattle that uh, are descended from the long established indigenous pre-colonial stock and they've been quite successful. Um, however, in the area that I was working in, in Mboiki, and which I showed a few, the pictures I showed, they're not favored. And one reason is this, that Nguni are probably more tick resistant and disease resistant. And if you have a private farm of say a thousand hectares, you will probably get a higher yield out of an Nguni herd than you will out of some other beef cattle. Um, but if you're on communal lands, on the whole, my interviews with African livestock keepers was that they preferred bigger animals. So they were, by and large, when they could, buying Brahmin or Brahmin type livestock, which is another introduction, although it, it has some of the characteristics of indigenous cattle, and you'll be able to tell me exactly what that is. <laughs> but that they found the Nguni too small. And there have been subsidized schemes by government, Forte University and others, to try to develop wider uptake amongst African communities who now own, I mean, somebody gave the figure 40% of the livestock in South Africa. I think it might be higher. I've seen figures that are closer to 50% of cattle um, because of the expansion of land available and also informal um, expansion of, of pastures. Um, on the whole, they, it seems that people are not really trying to or don't favor reintroducing Ngunis. There's been some success. I don't know if that's, but in, yes, all food crops, <laughs> all, you know, the, the same with sheep. Merino sheep have been the dominant breed in South Africa. They're Spanish via Germany and England. And they've been hugely successful in this country. And in, for example, that sheep scheme that I talked about, it is striking that there isn't resistance on the grounds of breed. It's quite the contrary. It has seemed Merino is most likely, if you can get the wool be good enough to give you a good return. And African lives are commoditized in many respects. In some ways, that's the crux of what I'm trying to say here. There are imaginations about what life could be, other lives could be, a restorationist view, whether it's at the political levels of chieftaincy or the restorationist view in village society. And the village I showed you pictures of in Boiki in certain ways does epitomize that. It's quite a traditionalist place amongst the older people, but central to almost everybody's life are income, <laughs> commodities, food purchase, education, um, and that's why marinos are favored in the sheep scheme rather than anything else. And there seems to have been very significant income, uh, sorry, take up in it, which I find intriguing. Okay, thank you for those questions. I think next I saw Olaf uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, Moses. Thank you very much, um, William, for this very inspiring talk. I think it that's a very important um, dimension and a topic that is somewhat underrepresented during our conversations we had last week in our land reform conference here. Um, I have three questions. The first question um, is directly related to what you seem to be raising in your, in your talk most importantly, I think, namely the question whether or not the moral and political need for land uh, transfer 
and productivity necessarily coalesce or not, right? And it seems that you are saying that possibly it actually doesn't, right? And that productivity issues might be a major concern. So my first question would be, how do you explain that there seem to be such a great disagreement within the bunch of colleagues working on land reform in South Africa, whether or not small holding and um, subsistence agriculture actually is going to work or not. So how do you explain this kind of quite massive disagreement? Secondly, what, what are people doing better in Malawi to actually succeed with small holding? Are there better incentives within the uh, agricultural sector, or is it rather the lack of alternatives or imaginations of alternatives? Is it a question of relative deprivation that people don't have alternatives so that they engage in small holding there, whereas in South Africa they might not be doing that? And then the third question is related to what you seem to be favoring, namely the private sector involvement. And I wonder, because I remember from debates on land restitution and land redistribution over the past 20 years that there was some kind of early excitement about public-private partnerships and the idea that this would be the silver bullet. But then there seemed to be also some kind of sobering experience that after all, when all running costs are paid and reinvestment is done, very little is actually left to be shared among very few shareholders in a kind of communal property associations beneficiary set. So what would be the, the secret to actually make this pay and work in practice? Thank you. Uh, thank you, William, for, for the talk. Um, I had a couple of questions, uh, one of which you kind of touched on in your answer to Jonathan, and that's about the non-material value of land. Uh, you seem to be uh, too focused on the material rewards that accrue from land ownership, uh, but I think we also have to think about the non-material uh, cultural and symbolic values of land ownership. Uh, and so, you know, I, I fully appreciate where you're coming from, but there has to be a way of reconciling, particularly with respect to uh, communal land ownership, reconciling the non-material value of land with uh, the material and commercial, um, you know, rationales of uh, land use and land ownership. And commercial and material, of course, especially the capitalist, um, you know, orientation that you are speaking about, tends to be very much uh, privatized uh, and personalized and that can be at odds with uh, communal land ownership. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a comment, but I wanted to ask you a more substantive question, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you seem to be suggesting that uh, the issue is not land ownership, the issue is land investment and productivity uh, and output. And, and I want to ask you whether you think that those two cannot be achieved, uh, in other words, that you cannot achieve uh, uh, a degree of land equitable ownership at the same time with investment and productivity, which you, you think to be you know, uh, the, the real issue. Are, are the two necessarily inco incompatible, such that you cannot you know, attain land reform uh, geared towards equitable ownership uh, or at least use, you know, uh, on the one hand, but also increased investment and productivity on the other hand. Are those two necessarily incompatible and irreconcilable? Thank you. Five big questions, and, um, and I've missed one of them. You'll have to ask me your middle one again. But why is there such disagreement? And, um, you know, it might be yeah, we, we, we have similar kinds of evidence. Uh, I think partly it's ideological. And I say that as someone who shared a more communalist approach to things at an earlier stage of my research and career. And I did briefly try to explain why I had shifted in my views. Um, I don't... <clears throat> I don't for a moment think that nothing is happening and the smallholders aren't producing anything. And I spoke also of a reasonably lively livestock economy in the rural areas. 
those, the majority of people at the conference uh, last week, of course, would push much more strongly for an idea that, this, that resilience and informal economies are more widespread, are producing more. And I'm very happy and do re to read the evidence and do read the evidence and try to get occasionally, or well not recently, to villages to do research. But I read it slightly differently. I mean, it still seems to me that it's very difficult to show otherwise than that commercial maize is yielding three times on the, on the whole um, of small, uh, that, sorry, three, three times more than smallholder maize. Um, that I accept that the gathering and wild fruits and all these things are important, but they don't seem to me to make a very significant difference to the amount of food that has to be bought. And I try to read village surveys that I can find. I mean, the one that I mentioned of Kukwini village by Hajdu and others actually would indicate that local production is significantly lower than I've been suggesting, that it's really only providing about 10 to 15 percent of household incomes for rural people in an area where there is quite a lot of land. So it, the evidence is read differently. Um, and I'm quite, in a sense, I'm quite happy to be wrong. Um, but where I 